So welcome everybody. This is our fifth episode of Notgueo Ponkyo Gewin. Um, old lady is uh, stopping visiting. That's what that means. <laughs> and we have two really beautiful guests here with us, uh, Jules Kostachin and Kim Anderson, uh, to share with us about menopause, to continue the discussion about Indigenous centered menopause. Um, this series has come about uh, just uh, by Tanya and I uh, discussing our own journey through menopause, um, facing walls of uh, kind of frustration with the uh, inability to find anything to around Indigenous centered menopause, um, finding out that some of our symptoms that we thought were you know, kind of driving us crazy, we didn't even realize were associated with menopause. And we, as we found out more, we wanted to find out first what it was called in our language, um, the Cree language. And so we started to ask around. Our first guests were uh, Tanya's mom, Margaret Capo and Maria Campbell. And that was a beautiful conversation that started us off in a really good way on uh, trying to give us some roots and foundation to why some of the reasons are that we that we don't really have a large discussion happening in our communities about this subject. Um, and so with that, I'm going to turn it over to my co host, uh, Tanya Capo. Hi, everyone. Um, good to be back. I, I guess one of the things that I, I wanted to say about um, today's conversation is when we hear from Jules and Kim about the work that they're doing, or have done around Indigenous women and menopause and perimenopause, I think you'll start to see um, a lot of similar themes sort of emerging, you know, I definitely when I watched Jules's little doc film on menopause with the ladies that she was having the conversations with, it all of it like totally resonated with things that I've been thinking about, conversations that Christy and I have had, and even when we had Jennifer Podemski on, some of the things that um, participants who joined that discussion were asking and talking about. And, and one of them um, that for me keeps emerging the most strongly from my own self is the, the aspect of ceremony. You know, um, there's a lot of teachings and ceremony and lessons around um, having your first moon time and then around birthing but really what is there for menopause? So that's one of the things that still um, is in my mind. And I really appreciated some of the, the comments around that um, in Jules's film. So hopefully she speaks a little bit more about that when, when we have our conversation with her. But I guess I just wanted to just lay out how we're going to be approaching today's conversation. So first we're, we're gonna finish up our little opening comments and then we will get our guests to introduce themselves. And then we'll go into sort of part two because this introduction part is part one. So the part two will start off with Jules. So we'll have a, a conversation with her about her film and, and a couple of other things. And that'll be for about 20 minutes or so. And then we'll, we'll go over to Kim and we'll do similar. We'll have a conversation with her, Christy and I, around her work, um, <clears throat> specifically some of her books and her writings around Indigenous women and life stages. And then after those other 20 minutes, we'll go into um, hopefully a conversation amongst the four of us with Christy and I throwing out some questions to sort of start a general conversation around uh, menopause in Indigenous women. So that's how today's approach is going to go. So um, I'll turn it back over to Christy to start out with the introduction. Actually, <laughs> the way we've been doing it is, um, it's always so uncomfortable when people read up a whole like bunch of introductions and like read. So we, we decided we're just not going to do that. And what we're going to do is just turn it over to each person and say, introduce yourself because that, that, but I was just watching that Res Dogs episode. Um, the one where the guy goes on there and he goes, I have a few things to say before I say some things, <laughs> you, say, you know, which, you know, which one I'm talking about. And he says, I shouldn't really talk about myself, but others have talked about me. So I will say those things. <laughs> goes on. Anyway, it's very funny. So introduce yourselves the way you wish. Um, 
And uh, we'll start with Kim and uh, just introduce yourself and then over to Jules. Okay, hi everybody, I'm Kim, uh, I'm Métis and I live in Guelph, Ontario and I work at University of Guelph as a professor in the Department of Family Relations and Applied Nutrition. Today I'm actually at Carleton University and I got the time wrong so I had to shuffle into somebody's office. So I'm in the School of Engineering and that's why there's all these hard hats behind me. <laughs> I'm in, I'm in somebody's office. Um, what can I say? I guess uh, I've been researching um, women's history, Indigenous women's history and teachings and so on for most of my career. And I too have been uh, challenged to find more information about menopause in particular. I, I think a lot about old ladies and their roles and, and responsibilities and so on. But um, you know, with all the ceremonial stuff, and maybe we can talk about this in my own research. And I, I put on my bio, uh, the most relevant, I guess, is I did a book on life stages in Native women. So in that life stages book, there I didn't have, uh, didn't find a whole bunch of stuff, but maybe we can talk about that. We can talk about that after. So that's me. Um, okay, watch it. Jos Kustachini Nani Tisina Kasu and Ottawapskat Nito Chin Maskwanito Tem. So I'm Bear Clan and I'm a band member of Ottawapskat First Nation. I'm Cree, Meshkego Cree, uh, Swampy Cree. And I live here on the unceded ancestral lands of the Coast Salish peoples, which is now called Vancouver, BC. And yeah, um, I'm a mom. I've got four sons, four cis males, which is a lot of testosterone um, in my house. <laughs> I got my mom. She's moved out here to BC. Um, yeah, I uh, just finished my PhD in 2021 in documentary film and protocols and how do we approach story and who has the rights to certain stories and so forth. Um, left academia and decided to focus on film full time and I haven't had to live in my car yet, so that's good. Uh, <laughs> keeping my head above water. I feel like a lot of the film that I do is around questions that I ask uh, I was privileged to have been raised by my grandparents. They both only spoke Inyinimoan, both lived off the land. We didn't have access to water and they were hunter trappers. So I feel very honored to have been raised by them. Um, my mom's a residential school survivor. She went to St. Anne's from the age to five to 16. So I feel like I have a lot of cultural knowledge, uh, maybe not yet articulated, but in the heart and soul. Um, just based on living with my grandparents, it's just uh, sometimes it's hard to speak to it with a colonial language like English. Sometimes it doesn't translate well. But yeah, that's me, Jules Kostachin. Happy to be here. Thank you. <laughs> Do I just keep going? <laughs> no, no, that's awesome. Thank you so much. Sorry, I had keep going. Everybody's looking at me. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> my mic was on mute there. Um, so, Jules, we'll just start with you. Um, so for the people who uh, on CBC Gem, uh, you can anyone can see your film. It's about 18 and some seconds long. Uh, and um, in in the film, you describe your reasons for wanting to bring the women together. And that's what you did in the film is you brought uh, some women together to discuss their their own experiences with menopause. And uh, for the people who haven't seen the film, can you tell us what your reasons were um, for wanting to do the film. Yeah, I feel like um, whenever I feel like there's a void or if I have a question, it's a really great place to start um, a documentary project because essentially that's what documentary is. Think of it as, as a visual essay, you're posing a question and then in the process of answering it, you have a film. So that's, uh, and I also feel like documentary is an indigenous archive in a way, like we're capturing stories of our elders and knowledge keepers and people who are very special and dear to us. So I feel like documentary is more than a colonial tool. I feel like it is our way to capture these stories for future generations. Um, with Kaya Meta, which translates to um, finding our truths, sharing our truths, I feel like I was just at a really bad point in my life. Like I was starting to gain weight. I was suffering with insomnia. I was losing all my muscle tone. I was getting really, really, really crabby, <laughs> especially with my kids. Um, I was just like, 
And it kind of like I started after I had my twins when I was 34, 35, I just felt this huge change in my body. Like I started going through perimenopause very young. Mm-hmm. Now I'm 50 and it's been like 15 years. So everybody is different. Um, so I feel like that's where I was just like, okay, doctors are not helping me. They, they prescribe this medication that makes you gain weight, lose your hair, and you can go through withdrawals when you stop taking it. So I was like, no, thank you. I think I'm going to go to my community. So I started, you know, just gathering some sisters and aunties and asking questions. And I felt like we were all kind of stuck. We were like, what the hell? And then I thought, are these some symptoms part of our diet, like this colonialism and stuff, like what we're putting into our body that's not traditional? I don't like using the word traditional too. I feel like that puts us on a timeline because um, what is con- traditional? Is it 50 years, 200, whatever? And I think the translation of traditional is doing something over and over again, which um, I think we do, but we also are a very, um, we can change as well. <laughs> we adapt to our environment. But I feel like with menopause, there's so many different factors. Like, is it diet? Is it the world in which we live? Is it trauma? Like I met some other women in the BIPOC community who said, well, thank you for your film who are outside of the native community. They said, our trauma is in our uterus, is in this area of our body. So when we're going through some huge shift, it brings up all these old memories and stuff like that. So it's more than just a change in our body. It's spiritual it's mental, it's physical, it's everything. So I feel like I just scratched the surface with my own issues that I was dealing with, but I found a woman's clinic and it's private, it's not covered. So I use my credit card. I was a student at the time and I just, it changed my life. Like right now I'm on progesterone and estrogen. And I know some people are not really into that, but for me, I got my life back. Like I started sleeping. I started losing the weight that I was gaining. I got my energy back. But the thing is with that, you're constantly changing your doses because um, dosage, because your body is constantly changing when you're going through this phase of life. So talking to my sisters, which was funny, I thought it was going to be this hilarious documentary, you know, when a bunch of native women get together and, you know, I I honestly did not expect it to take this dark turn. And I'm kind of glad that it did because it brought up this whole notion of what we do when we have our period, the ceremonies that some of us may have missed out on. Um, And it also opened the door around gender because most of us, um, we don't, we don't have this binary of gender. A lot of us have multiple genders and LGBTQ community, like how does this all fit? Like, so I just felt like I scratched the surface there in terms of talking about menopause and who it actually impacts and how it impacts our bodies, our diverse bodies. But yeah, it was fun. Um, (laughs) I learned a lot and uh, getting my life back slowly. Again, I have to change my dosage um, because my body went through this change again. But anyway, I feel like that film kind of opens doors for more dialogue. And uh, I think we have to be way more inclusive too in terms of this discussion. Like how does it impact outside of these two colonial genders? But yeah, sorry, that's my rant. It actually posed more questions than anything, I think, in doing that documentary, which is a good thing because that's how stories are. Stories carry agency and they're alive. And, you know, people create other stories from that one particular story. So I feel like, you know, it's this this thing that just continues to grow and change. And I'm hoping that um, because of this film too, I've had a lot of women outside of the native community hold menopause parties. Mm-hmm. menopause circles every month I've become the menopause queen which uh, I'm not that kind of a doctor <laughs> doctor philosophy but <laughs> I welcome it but I don't have like I'm not you know I just know what worked for me but might not necessarily work for others so yeah okay so what I want to do is I'm going to sh- share my screen so I can put your film that the page on there so people can see it so they can write it down so they can watch it okay. so while I'm doing that I just want to um, respond to a couple of things you were saying. So can you all see that? Is it is it there? That's my duck lip picture. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so one of the things, this is on the CBC um, Short Docs website, and there's the title of the film, and, and that's how you can go and find it if you want, so you can take a a listen to it. Um, a couple of things I just wanted to quickly respond to was you 
Christy and I are finding the exact same thing. Every time we were talking about something, something up else comes up like, oh my God, what about this? What about that? And so part of what we want to do with these discussions is try to be as inclusive as we can to everything that comes up. So we do, we are hoping and planning to have the discussion um, on menopause from you know, non-gender, non-binary perspectives and even a trans perspective. Um, assuming we find people who are willing to talk about that. And also, I think one of the ones that comes up a lot is uh, for people who haven't had children and how they're experiencing menopause from that place. That's that's a big one that keeps coming up. So those are some really good points. I, I just wanted to to raise those. So before I stop sharing my screen, um, I was watching this today and I just really like I said earlier, it really resonated a lot with me, a lot in the conversation. In fact, I also keep a fan handy, as I see <laughs> Nina does in the film, so do I. I have one at home and one that travels with me because hot flashes are terrible, terrible. Can't stand them. <laughs> but, oh, I love them. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the question that I wanted to ask actually um, comes from some of the text that's on this page, you know, at the bottom where it talks about the film and things like that. Um, the quote that I pulled out from there is, why is menopause understood by so many as negative? I understand that it's not the most fun thing to go through, but it's a part of life or is it? The question led me to ask whether or not Indigenous women have answers to how it was treated in the past prior to it being seen as a taboo. We do ceremonies for girls when they transition to womanhood with their first menses, menses, but what about when it comes to an end? Did Indigenous women do ceremony for women in the community when their menses ended? So I, I talked a little bit about this also at the beginning. So the question I have is, what have you learned about perimenopause or menopause since the time that you made a film? need this film, either in general, like maybe physical things or specifically from an indigenous person's experience? I've, I've learned that I'll probably have my period for another five years because it seems like native women have their periods forever. So I don't know if that has anything to do with stats or something, but I've learned that, like even talking to my doctors, I'm like, when is this going to end? When is the old lady gonna go on and find someone else? Um, I've learned that your body continuously changes every three months Well, when you're going through perimenopause. And that's why you have to continuously get different dosages if you, you know, are on progesterone or estrogen. I've learned that um, I think that there was one particular point, I think in my early forties where I wasn't dealing with stress so well. I think a lot of us are in survival mode, especially if we're living in poverty and so forth. I learned that when you're younger, you can deal with that's not even it's not even a normal thing, but you're dealing with stress or your body is taking it a little bit easier as than when you get a little bit older, it's harder on your body. So your progesterone levels can get really, really low. And that also negatively impacts your body and your symptoms and so forth. So the thing is to try to get those progesterone levels back to normal and then look at your estrogen. Um, what else have I learned? I've learned that. Again, I don't really like to use that word traditional so much because I feel like we're always ever changing and you know that's how we're surviving. That's why we're still here. Is that what is tradition? What is ceremony? And that ceremony can be anything really when you're gathering with your aunties or whoever you feel you have that bond with and you're able to ask these kinds of questions. Ceremony can be as simple as saying, thank you when your period ends and sending off the old lady in a good way. Um, I don't know, I just feel like uh, we really have to delve deeper. I feel like uh, we need to ensure that these clinics are no longer privatized, that they're accessible for all peoples, um, because it is very lonely when you're going through this huge change. You know, when you get your period, you have your friends and everybody's excited. Did you get your period? Did you get your, you know, it's a big thing. Um, and in most cases, it's welcomed, right? Especially in today's society, sometimes with young folks, but I know there was a time when it was taboo as well. But I feel like, what what are we doing now? 
what are we doing to support each other? I knew a woman who had a legal practice and she left her job because of the symptoms of menopause and there was no support in place for her. So what needs to change systemically, I think, to support um, folks that are going through this shift in life? Um, I don't feel like there's enough happening for us that we have to kind of we're posing these questions, but I'm seeing what's interesting now on social media is I'm seeing these things popping up around menopause and, you know, there's more discussion now. So I feel like we're in a good place, but there's still a lot of work to do. And maybe Kim can speak to this in terms of nutrition and, you know, like even colonialism and how that's impacted us as Indigenous women as well, or Squaywalk. Um, I just feel like there's so many questions. And what were those ceremonies? What did we do? And is it because of settler colonialism that we've not talked about what we used to do in the past or is it so underground? Um, I don't know, I just feel like maybe we can reinvent ourselves and find something that works for us moving forward. Uh, when my twins had their walkout ceremony, uh, we uh, an elder could not join us. So we did it in a park in Toronto and an elder just happened to walk by and then she did the ceremony for us. <laughs> so I just feel like, when you put that question out there, the spirits do answer, our ancestors do answer, but I think we have to be open to things um, in terms of how we move forward, like in ceremony and so forth, and redefine what that means. And it's individual too, right? And I feel like whatever we do to make our lives easier and support each other is ceremony. Those are the things I've kind of learned. But yeah, I feel like I'm going to be going through perimenopause, my doctor said, probably for another five years. So I'm just like, oh, Lord, help me. She goes, you're still going strong. You can still have babies. And I'm like, no, nah, no, thanks. <laughs> I'll probably be a grandmother soon. I don't want to have any more babies. But anyway, it's just, it's just uh, what it is. But everybody's different. Like Michelle Thrush in my film, she hers just ended just like that. And I met people who have no symptoms at all. And then there's myself for 15 years. So I just feel like everybody's so individual in terms of you know how this happens for them. Period. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah, thank you. So I guess we'll um we'll um Tanya, you're going to uh start with uh asking Kim a question, eh? <laughs> yes, sorry. <laughs> All right. So um welcome Kim. So great to see you again. Um so we, we wanted to talk with you a little bit about your, your work, your writings, particularly um, the life stages and native women, memory teachings and story medicine. So there is uh, the book. If anyone wants to quickly write that down, the, the title for it. And the question that I have is uh, considering your research with elders and specifically your friendship and being mentored by Maria Campbell, what does Notoguio mean to you? So what does the word encompass? So Maria was um, part of our first two conversations. And in trying to think about when Christy and I decided we wanted to do this series of discussions, we were thinking, well, what should we call it? You know, menopause is such an ugly word and it just doesn't feel like we want to use that word in our title. So what did we use to call it? And so that led us down this asking Maria and I was asking my mom, you know, what did we call it in Cree? What did we call menopause in Cree? And so that's how the name came and Notagwe was an important part of that. So going back to the question, um, what, what does Notagwe mean to you? Like if you could think um, through all of the conversations you've had with people, Indigenous women, Cree women, at this point in your life, what does it mean for you? Okay, what what it means is, of course, you're multitasking. <laughs> there's, I'm in somebody's office and there's somebody knocking to get in. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, what does it mean? I guess it means, like when I think about, um, that means like this, it has to do with the stories, right? And the old lady that keeps the stories and the, the, the original stories, which are also the laws. And um, it also has to do with kinship. 
like being the keeper of kinship, the keeper of, of those laws. And that's what old ladies do, right? So um, I don't know if it has to be something that happens after menopause, but typically it is, or it would be that that's that stage of life that you enter into where you sort of like have this responsibility to, I think it's, I think of it as a governance responsibility, like you're, where you're, you're kind of um, looking out for, you know, those large circles of relations and um, holding the, holding the people in place by maintaining the laws and working with, you know, holding onto those things of kinship and looking after, looking after that, right? So it's not like being the, it's not a patriarchal thing. It's not like being the family servant. It has to do with the governing responsibilities of women. And especially the old women, the old ladies are the ones who are kind of like the, the, the bosses of all of that, right? So that's what we, that's what Notagueo is all about to me and how we can kind of like transition into those roles when we, as we, as we grow older, right? So, I mean, I don't think about, maybe this is because I had, I, it was kind of like the menopause, the physical part of menopause has been like, I kind of just went through it. I didn't, fortunately, I didn't have some of the things that Jules is talking about, right? The symptoms, um, it was really kind of uneventful physically for me and I'm long past it now, but um, it is something that um, has caused me to reflect on my own responsibilities and those responsibilities I'm gonna take up and how do I become that old lady who has those responsibilities. And so it, to me, it's like a really good thing. It's freeing in terms of uh, the types of ceremonial work you can do. And at the same time, it comes along with, um, you know, consideration about how you're going to look after everybody pretty, pretty much, right? I mean, in a different way than you do when you're in a different way than you do when you're younger and you're, you're a mom or an auntie or however it is we take up responsibilities for looking after community um, when we're younger. And as one person said to me, you know, when you're young, you can say a lot and do a lot, but when you're, when you're old, people have to listen. <laughs> so, so I think that's like um, kind of a freeing position to be in as well. I don't know. I mean, I've always loved older people and old ladies and um, just learning from people and um, the kind of comfort that comes with that as well. So moving into that, I mean, I don't, I don't want to I don't want to, I'm not, I'm not all excited about all the shitty stuff that comes with aging. Like you're on my eyes, not working right. And like I'm creaky and all those things than I used to, than I used to be. But um, just being in that kind of like position of being an older woman, there's a love and a beauty to that too. I don't know. And, and, and I think that that's what it's brought for me. Right. Um, and I remember a long time ago, I had a friend that was going through it when I was young. I was I was hanging out with older people when I when I was younger, and I remember her going through menopause. This was a this was a, a white woman who was like a teacher to me, like an auntie to me, kind of raised me and taught me lots of things. And she was having such a hard time. And I went to an elders conference and I came back and I said, "Well, um, you know, I heard at this conference that this is like now now like once you go through this, now you can wear." The way they said it was now you can wear pants, which I know is controversial. There's the politics of the skirt. There's all sorts of stuff. But for her at that time, it was really liberating because she understood what they were trying to say about the type of power that you have um, when you after you've gone through that transition. Right. So um, it's always been kind of like a really positive thing for me. And I guess I was lucky enough that I dodged a bullet personally that, you know, I mean, there's stuff about my body that I'm kind of like, yeah, this isn't, you know, <laughs> this isn't great, right? But um, I guess the other stuff makes up for it, right? The spiritual stuff, you know, if we think physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual, um, that kind of makes up for the aging, the aging process that we go through, right? I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah, it, it does. Believe. It totally does. In the first episode, when we had my mom and Maria on, my mom was talking about how, you know, menopause was, is, or was like a, a 
phase of coming into your own power, like finding okay. yourself. And, and I think that um, that's really important thinking and place that I personally would like to focus because it's really hard to not go there in my mind when the physical parts of menopause are so difficult and sometimes, you know, very painful and lead you to these places that you don't, a dark place. And then what I was hoping, what I'm hoping is that when we are reclaiming menopause as Indigenous women, Indigenous people, that it goes to that, that it's reclaiming our power and how do we bring that back? So that totally, totally resonates with that. Yeah, and even like, um you know, like things like gaining weight and getting wrinkles and looking like that. Sometimes I think about that with the young people I work with. And I'm like, well, I think there's a love and a comfort in an older woman's body that that they can only access if you if you you make if that if that's like if you allow yourself to become that and then um allow them to allow them to have access to that. I don't know, it sounds weird, but it's just like, think about um, older women that you know, and would you feel, would you feel better if somehow or other they were like, you know, um, doing all sorts of Botox and like dieting and doing all this stuff to try to look younger? Or do you take comfort in the way that their bodies are and in and the way that they look, right? So yeah. sometimes I think about that and I'm like, you know what, like if I start to like get older and like when you're, of course, after you go through menopause, that's when you lose your, um, you know, the collagen in your skin starts to change and all these things. I think I remember you telling me something about that one time, Christy, about your mom telling you like after you go through menopause, everything starts, starts to, you know, your skin loses its, uh, its elasticity and you look a little gray or whatever. And, uh, but I thought, you know, I think my, and I work a lot with students because I'm a prof, right? So I, those are kind of like the, the people, the young people that I work with. And I'm like, you know what? I think maybe it kind of comes as a comfort to them too, that if this is the way I look, that, um, you know, it gives them a sense of ease that they would feel with a grandmothers or people, older people in their, in their life. And, and that's a new kind of power, not power, but it's a new kind of love that I can uh, offer to people. And that does come with having an aging body and having a, I would think, a postmenopausal body, right? I don't know if that makes any sense to people. Maybe not. Yeah, yeah, that's that's uh, really good. I, I, so this is the book again, everyone. It's life stages and Native women. I always want to say something <laughs> life stages of, but life stages and Native women. And it's uh, got a foreword by Maria Campbell and it's published by, who's it published by? University of Manitoba Press. And uh, you will, and you can get that at uofmpress.ca. Um, I'm gonna read a little quote. This is in the conclusion. Uh, there's two parts in this conclusion that I thought was really interesting. Uh, well, you have a, a nice quote from Maria about um, there's a lot of things in the in the getting older chapter that I really enjoyed reading, um, especially around the idea of midwifery and mm -hmm. how the old lady is, um, how Maria describes an old lady who births you in like helps to be the midwife for you to come into this world and then receives you on the other end. So through the birthing, through birthing and death, um, um, that that it's always uh, in the realm of old old women who who have these responsibilities and then on the spiritual side of things or in the spirit world I love that idea of of a, an old woman being the midwife birthing us into the world and then catching us as as we as we are birthed into that other world that we're going to go to and um, anyway that's just an aside but uh, on page 164, you say, uh, as women aged and passed through menopause, they were given a new kind of respect that allowed them to move in and out of male and female jurisdictions, that they were recognized for their leadership. Stories about the grandmother's leadership positions demonstrate some of the counter imperial author authorities I had been looking for as I set out to write the book. And then in another uh, part of this conclusion, you talk about health 
um, restoring the roles and, and the health of, of, as you already spoke about, kinship and culture, kinship and, and the, the responsibilities of, of um, older people coming into the roles of, of being elders in our communities. I mean, I love the way that we can say old women and we know amongst ourselves when we say that it's with reverence and love and respect. It's yeah. different than uh, Western ways of saying old, you know, and I just, I just love that, that that's already understood. But what I wanted to ask you specifically was, um, well, there's lots of things I want to ask you, but I'll just ask you, like, since you wrote the book, are there things that you've learned that you, that you would have wanted to ask the people that you interviewed for the book or things that you've learned that you would have added to the book? What's your, what's your, what are the things that you think are like, not necessarily missing, but just that, you know, as we go on, we learn so much more. What are, what are some of those things that you're thinking about these days? Yeah, totally. And I, I will encourage whoever's listening to go perhaps and, and do these kinds of research too. So when we were talking about the ceremonial uh, components of it, I can't remember if I asked people about ceremonies directly, or if it just never came up. But I would say that would be great if people can go and, and ask older people in their communities about if there were ceremonies. Because um, I actually, it's about life stages. So I have everything from um, before birth to, to old ladies, right? From the, the infants. So there's, there's stuff on ceremonies all the way through, but there's nothing on ceremonies around menopause. And it could be, I must have asked because I was asking about the ceremonies at each stage. And I didn't get any information. I've often wondered about that. And other people have told me it could be when I was doing oral history, it could be um, like I could ask people about ceremonies because they had witnessed or had been part of those themselves. And there could have been stuff going on with the older women, but they weren't part of it because maybe those ceremonies were happening among the older women and the people that I was interviewing were talking about what they understood in their childhood communities, right? And so they probably, they maybe just weren't part, maybe these things were going on, but the people that we get oral history from now are the elders that we talk to. Maybe they weren't part of those, those circles, right? Or maybe we didn't have them. That's what other people have said to me. Um, but yeah, the question about like, is there something you wish you would have done? maybe I wish I, I could, or maybe somebody could go out there and dig a little more and, and I just ask people directly about that, right? Um, but I haven't yet found people that will talk about like ceremonies in particular. And maybe it's, I don't, I don't know. I think this is a, such an intriguing question, right? That we could talk about amongst ourselves about if maybe there weren't, why not? Right. <laughs> like, why not? Why do we have ceremonies for walking out or naming? And obviously, uh, uh, puberty is like a really big time. And there's a reason why you have uh, puberty fasts and seclusions and all these things, actually, just like in cultures all around the world, um, you know, like that adolescent stage or when you go into your time is considered a highly charged spiritual time. Right. But maybe it's easier to have ceremonies because, of course, your period happens and it happens, right? There's a time when it happens. Whereas menopause, like Jules is saying, it could be like 15 years. So how do you have a ceremony? If you don't know when it starts, you're not exactly sure where, when it ends. Uh, and it could be 15 years long if, or whatever, 10 years long. So how do you have a ceremony around that kind of thing? Or what do you do to acknowledge those transitions in, in life? And I think the response, like to me, it's about like all our ceremonies are about um, they're about responsibility to community and engagement with community. If you think about the ceremonies that we have throughout our life stages, right? Like, so, you know, naming, it's like you're being, you're being brought into community as a baby and your, your name has to do with your response. It all has to do with responsibility, right? Walking out. It's like that thing where we, that, you know, we replicate the things that we're going to contribute and puberty stuff is really all about, like, especially the girl stuff is really all about, um, you know, being part of that kind of regenerative force of the universe and what you're going to do for that life force. But um, how do we acknowledge a ceremony in a ceremonial way, the types of responsibilities we have as old ladies? Um, that's something that comes gradually and through work, I think. So it's harder. I think it would be harder to sort of like mark that as a transition. And, you know, the way that we grow into responsibilities as we age, it's a slow 
it's a slow process and it comes through all the different types of work that we do along the way. So like, I remember Danny Muskwa explaining to me, he said like, there's three kinds of elders. There's three stages of elders. There's the community elder. And that's the ones like you, uh, Christy and Tanya, you know, you're organizing, you're doing all this stuff, right? You're organizing in the community, you're doing this work. And then there's the ceremonial elder, he said, you know, so that's the one uh, says it all, right? And then there's the earth elder, which is when you're old and you're not moving around so much and people come to you. So how do you mark transition between those things? It's not, I don't think it's as, maybe it's just because it's not as straightforward, but this is what I would do. I would be like, okay, maybe we need to have that conversation, right? And about menopause in particular, I'm sure, of course, there was medicines to help people with the physical and the, well, not just, it's, it's all connected, but I'm sure there's medicines that people know and still use, but um, yeah, the ceremony, I don't know. I don't know, or the celebrations of it, like, how does that work, right? Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. So yeah. I think um, what we're going to do is uh, not ask so many questions in terms of just like um, question, answer, question, answer. We're going to switch it up and and turn it over to allowing us to have more of a conversation. So uh, Jules and Kim, you're welcome to speak to each other and ask each other questions too. And we'll just comment that way. Um, and uh, so I think uh, Tanya had, was going to kick us off with a question, weren't you, Tanya? Yeah. So the sort of general question that I have for both of you is um, reflecting back to your own journey, what would you want your younger self to know about menopause? Like if you, how could you start to help your younger self prepare for your older self? And some of the challenges and some of the gaps um before i answer that i feel like i need to add to with my specific community up in northern ontario in terms of gender roles and stuff that was not necessarily a binary either and i know someone made a comment too about two-spirit identity but i feel it's so necessary to be inclusive in this dialogue is that my grandmother was a hunter trapper my grandfather was beating and stuff too, like they switched those gender roles. And I feel like um, with this conversation around, you know, puberty and coming of age and stuff like that, how do we, it's an interesting thing. And I, I did teach like indigeneity and gender and sexuality and stuff like that. And it was really hard for me to locate any kind of stories and stuff like that. So it all kind of evolved out of the conversations in the classroom. And it really is just, so important to kind of keep that question there as well as like, um, you know, the binary and stuff like that. Like, how do we ensure that these conversations are inclusive and moving forward is like, because we're we're silencing voices and experiences. So, and um, I just feel like that was necessary too to say, like my grandparents, you know, up in Mishkego and watching my grandmother be a, one of the best hunter trappers. So I feel like what, what we think today, did that apply 100 years ago when they were alive? I don't know. I just feel like that's why I kind of steer away from the word traditional too, because I feel like, okay, but what was it 100 years ago where my grandmother was young and what were the ceremonies? And did we actually need those ceremonies because the symptoms were not so bad? Maybe it is diet. Maybe it is trauma. So those are other questions that I want to just, I don't have the answer to any of these, but I'm just thinking this as we were talking. Um, and I feel like as a kid, I just wish I'd spent more time with my grandparents um, and had, you know, those kinds of conversations. I also think we need to kind of talk about sexuality as well and aging. And that was one of the questions in the film. And all the women were really shy and covering their mouths and nobody wanted to talk about it, even though some were self-proclaimed cougars, which is totally fine to claim. You know, that we have to talk about like our, our sexuality doesn't end either <laughs> as we age, you know, like we could still work to feel desirable and feel sexy and feel alive. I know that when I went through all my symptoms and stuff, I was not feeling myself like I was getting depressed. You know, even the weight gain, I felt it in my body. I just didn't feel right about who I was uh, physically, spiritually, mentally. So 
that's why I sought help. You know, I was just not getting any answers from anybody. And I felt like I was slowly getting my life back. So, cause I'm still working. I still want to work. I still, I don't want to be sleeping and taking a nap when we're filming. Where's Jules? Oh, she's napping right now. Like I, I still want to be part of, you know, work in the workforce. I want to be here still. So I got to find ways to find that energy and, you know, find, eat better. And, and for myself, I feel like, and I just wanted to add that, but yeah, in terms of just what I would, I just wish I had more time with my, my Nana and, and I know my mom being a residential school survivor too, she was taken at the age of five, returned home at 16. So a lot of things were robbed um, from her and that trauma too. And how uh, also we have to talk about the high rates of hysterectomies within indigenous community and sterilization of indigenous women. Like these, these are all factors that um, impact when we go through changes in our lives. So this is a huge, maybe this is someone's PhD, if there's anybody listening here, <laughs> then you can keep gathering, you know, be a story weaver, keep asking these questions. But yeah, anyway, that's all I have to add. Thank you. Miigwech. <laughs> yeah, I totally, I totally agree. All of the, the questions that come up and in looking around for resources, it would be so helpful if someone could go and do research <laughs> and help us all out. <laughs> um, Kim, did you have any anything you wanted to add or share? Um, what are you? Oh, you were asking about whether what we would do if we were younger. Yeah, what would you tell your younger self? Yeah, so I guess um, when you are younger, just having the ability to hang around with older people. Um, allows you to learn about that before you get there, right? Like I was talking about my friend who was going through a hard time and I was in my twenties and I was just sort of like learning about menopause at that point because of her experience. And then thinking back to like, if people are doing oral history or like when I was trying to um, talk to elders about it, I guess they, they were saying like, they didn't talk about it with their older, with their old, with their aunties and stuff. And so that therefore, they didn't have that knowledge because it was just the things they knew about were the things they'd witnessed and participated in. And so maybe just asking those questions when you're younger and, and not, um, not waiting till you get to be, you know, in the menopausal stage to be, to try to, to try to figure it out. I mean, that's how we, that's how we learn and we, we share knowledge too, right. It's like intergenerationally like that. So um, yeah, I mean, just learning and asking questions. And also, I mean, I like what, Jules is saying about, you know, problematizing the word tradition. And I think also thinking about, and, and, you know, you can work with new ceremonies and all that kind of stuff. And also thinking about going into the future because, and all, and within the context of the, you know, the way we think about gender is, um, is changing, you know, so where are we going with it? I know that, yeah, we, we have these patriarchal binary gender, um, gendered roles and responsibilities in the past necessarily, but we're also transitioning into how we're going to work with it in the future too. But this is, this is very much a, I mean, men, we're talking about menopause, which is also very much uh, grounded. It, it's about that period, that period in your life when you stop menstruating. Right. So there's something really, um, I don't know. There's something that you have to work with there too, eh? It's grounded in that. And what do we and what what do we do with that sort of ceremonially? Yeah, I find this uh, like the all of the discussion around this it could could all go branch off into really uh, deep areas. I know, like I'm really curious about um, the issue of forced sterilization and curious about and how that impacts. Uh, people that are like um, also access to healthcare, so um, the the barriers to accessing health, um, the racism that are that's within the healthcare system, and how that impacts a person being even able to access uh, help during menopause. Because even for people who are living in urban areas or have a have access to healthcare, that we're not even getting the care anyway. So how does that How's that compounded for people that don't have access to healthcare or who are facing systemic barriers and racism within the system? And 
I think a lot of times we think of menopause as um, something that we come into naturally, whereas there's early onset menopause caused by a number of um, health factors and reasons why, including forced sterilization or hysterectomies due to health health reasons. Um, and those things need to be, we need to suss those out. I think we're going to have one um, session with Dr. Janet Smiley just on that specific topic alone, but just like a short, uh, like a one session won't cover everything in depth, but at least we'll be able to to discuss that. And also with with uh, trans women, like, and trans, um, so trans people, what is their experience with, with menopause? Um, trans men, what's their experience with menopause? Um, and, and also a uh, statistic, I think I mentioned this before, which was, I just read this statistic, which said that in the US, um, two spirit people are, well, they said LGBTQIA, people are 8% less likely to access healthcare. And I was thinking, um, well, what is that statistic here? We have no stats, we have no data to be able to really draw on to find out uh, what would that statistic be for our people um, who two spirit people like in terms of like indigenous people, not our, you know, and uh, so uh, just trying to figure out like what that statistic would be because obviously it would be a lot higher we just know that in instinctually that it would be higher so these are all really good. Um, things that we do have to like you said maybe have a <laughs> people go out and do PhDs on and and start asking questions uh, for myself I wish that. Um, I think I wish I understood uh, at a younger age um, the physical things like that that are making me feel terrible now physically um, and what would I have done differently younger would I have even listened I don't know but um, like for example the stubborn weight gain like the weight gain is terrible and I just can't lose it and I I mean you know I'm eating way better than I ever have so that's on that that's a positive and I'm exercising and I'm doing all the things you know and it's just like I turn around and it's like five ten pounds heavier I'm like I don't I don't know I'm gonna eat air just to survive <laughs> from now on because it's not working and um you know like those kinds of things oh the muscle loss that you mentioned Jules like seriously if I had have understood that menopause was more than hot flashes it's so much more that the that the dropping estrogen levels in my body were going to affect uh, my muscle uh, retention and and then to think of mobility, getting older. Um, Kim, I liked in your book when you when with the research that you did with Danny Musqua about the different stages of elders. So I don't think I've ever really thought about that before. That you know you get to be you're like a working elder. <laughs> you're like you know like you get to be an elder who's like doing the community work or the ceremonial work or going being out there and, and managing so much on behalf of the people or your family or whatever it is that you're doing. Um, and then then you reach another stage and Maria's just started talking about this uh, recently, which is you reach this other stage of of your of your elderhood, I suppose. And um, in that stage, it you feel different again, she said. You know, once you reach about 80 or so, and I was like, I don't even think I understood that. And so I'm trying to tell my younger self now, who's going to, you know, fingers crossed, reach that stage. Um, what would I want to do now to prepare for that stage? So these are the questions that I've been sort of asking myself. I don't really have any question. I just want to toss that. I think I, I strive to be someone like Alanis Obamsawin, who is still working in her 90s because she does film and she's one of my icons. So you know, I've known her since I was 19. So she's definitely someone I look up to. I'm really tall, look eye to eye to or look down. Not, you know what I mean? Physically, <laughs> I'm a very tall woman. Uh, Alanis is tiny, but I just feel like with her, just watching her journey and still working and still creating work. And that's what I hope, you know, I, I hope I'm still working at 90. <laughs> I really do. And I'm still mobile like her. That would be great. But yeah interesting well we're lucky enough to be in cultures where people do that right people yeah work. i mean the ones that are you know giving they're not sitting around in a rocking chair or you know whatever 
drying up on the golf course or something. You just continue to have roles in the community, whether your role is being a filmmaker or whatever, storyteller or somebody who, whatever you do, right? Somebody who creates art, works with people, whatever, right? So it's kind of, in in many ways, we're kind of lucky because we have stuff that's built in for us that continues to value even though we might get like a little bit forgetful or a little dotty or whatever it is, right? Not able to walk quite as fast or whatever, we still have things that we're we're expected to contribute, right? So. I was I dancing know. with Alanis in, Montre uh, in Toronto in October at Imaginative Film Festival. She was still dancing. <laughs> I just love it so much. Just that. Yeah, she's amazing, but yeah. Yeah. So I, I have a question about um, sort of the men in our lives, you know, menopause definitely happens to us, but it happens to them also vicariously. And I feel like they're an important part of the conversation. And I think maybe Jules, you have some thoughts as you have sons and Kim, you've done some work around masculinities. Do you have any thoughts around how our male counterparts fit in this conversation? Um, I feel like as a mom for son, I feel like, you know, I raised my boys to have like really critical mindsets. Like I just raised my kids, um, you know, around the LGBTQ community as well. So they had um, insight and understanding of different lived experiences. So I feel like my boys, they're cis male. That's how they identify. I feel like, um, they catch themselves. I think my voice is so in their head that if they say something super sexist or something, they stop mid sentence and look over at me because I'm so in their head. Like, because I just feel like having these conversations since they were small or always like if they made a statement, be like, what do you mean by that? What? You know, and then just getting them to not question everything that they think or say, but question this colonial society in which we exist as Indigenous people. Um, I feel like, but with that said, I'm competing with television, I'm competing with social media, I'm always competing with these like toxic um, masculinity, I don't know, just I feel like I'm always in competition, but I, I'm very present in their lives, even to this day, my oldest son is 28. So we still have conversations and I, I hear him talk to other people about things that I would say to him, or I have said to him. So I feel like it works. I feel like they need to be part of the conversation. They can't be outside of it, you know? still have my period so the kids see all the pads and tampons and everything around the house I'm not going to hide it it's just like this is what it is so I feel like I've always had this kind of open conversation with my boys um and they're really great men now so I I don't know I just feel like it's just how they were raised and being raised with my grandparents and they were actually raised by their great-grandparents as well so um in culture and ceremony I think that helps a lot right like to have that kind of just a whole bunch of people in their lives with very different lived experiences really helps them kind of form who they are and being open to how they identify and so forth is really key as well. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess I would say have if if men understand the the all through all through our our life stages of our bodies, right? Like through periods and the maternal body, pregnancy, like the different things. Not that everybody does pregnancy, but um, when you're at that, when you're at these different stages, do they understand what it is that um, that you're going through, and and also, um, you know, the sacredness of all of that, of the of the of the female body, right? Do they understand that? And and I think that menopause is like part of that, right? What does that mean when you're going through that? What does the changes mean? What can you expect? All that kind of stuff. It sounds kind of basic, I guess, but. But perhaps, yeah, having access to more kind of these kind of conversations or Jules's film or whatever, right? Um, learning more about it so that they are not, you know, kind of ignorant about those things that we go through, right? My son, my oldest son worked on Kayameta. He learned a lot. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> he brought me the last day, he went to a health food store, bought me some menopause pills. He's like, mom, I got these for you. Like, what is this? I don't even know what this is. <laughs> he's ready for, he's ready. He's ready. To I don't know how my son identifies yet, but yeah, if he is in that relationship, he will be ready. 
<laughs> that was so kind of funny though oh my god I was like okay that's cool the fact that he went into a health food store did his research and asked questions that's awesome that's awesome yeah it's I, just being that supporter and helper right and then yeah. in whatever way like that's what what he was offering so I think that's <laughs> that's cool it's really funny yeah um, I think there was some questions around body image and stuff too. In the question, I was trying to answer some questions, but yeah, I feel like with body image, you have to be comfortable in your own skin, right? We're, our bodies change from childhood up until whatever age, you know. And I just feel like we just have to. I'm I just like to exercise and move and stuff like that. I'm not so necessarily focused on what the exterior is. It's just more how I feel on the inside that impacts my day. If I feel good in the morning, wake up, I had a good sleep. Because the worst thing is the insomnia. You're having like three hours sleep and you're sweaty and you're gross and you just feel nasty because you've just been up all night sweating. And yeah, I feel like when you're feeling good in your skin, regardless of what age you're at or what stage you're at, I feel like that is definitely a, a good thing to strive towards. But it's hard when you don't have those resources. You're kind of doing it and trying to survive through that without, you know, support. Yeah, I think um, on one of our next month in one of our conversations, we're going to be talking to Alana Whiskey Jack about community organizing as women to sort of as, as a way to help through this and maybe eventually di discover or, or make some new ceremonies around menopause, maybe, you know, something yeah. like that. But definitely trying to think about what tools do we have within our own selves in our own communities that we can do this work and support each other and support ourselves. So that definitely is an important one. Yeah, nutritionists. Yeah, just... Sorry, Sorry. Can... go ahead. No, I just said nutritionists are great too. Nutritionalists, nutritionists. Yeah. Nutritionists or nutritionalists? Yeah, and I was wondering about um, medicines too. I don't know if we have people that are going to come on and talk about that, but I'm sure that there are all sorts of uh, of medicines. Like I've been doing um, Ayurvedic stuff to try to deal with a whole bunch of health issues, but I often think, well, you know, like why am I doing this stuff that comes from India? <laughs> and I have, you know, I have gone to, um, you know, people like Jan Longbo over the years I first went to see her actually when I, I think when I was pregnant about medicine but you know how do we get access to this stuff are there I don't know it's like our because I didn't have such a hard time with menopause I didn't go to seek out traditional medicine around that per se but um yeah could be cool if if people are able to um come on and talk about that and I know that we don't often share those things it's hard to access people are afraid of it getting stolen or whatever but it could be that there's some basic stuff like there's, you know, how we, when we think about medicines, yeah, there were people who had their specialties and their areas of expertise, but there's lots of medicine that everybody knew and everybody used. So are there some kind of like those everyday type of things that it's not like we have to worry about people using them wrong or ripping them off or whatever, but is there everyday stuff that people use to help out? I don't know. I, I of course there, of course there is, right? I don't know if you're going to have folks talk about that, but that would be cool. Yeah, we want to have uh, definitely want to have an episode on medicines, and we've we've talked about that. We've have a couple people that we're that we're reaching out to, and I think what we've sort of been finding, and with people's comments and participation with the one um, episode with Jennifer Podemsky, is that people those everyday medicines are ones that are specific to their region, of course, their lands, their waters. And so it's, it, I think it would be really interesting to have kind of a sharing session because we know that it's not one medicine fits all um, in, and even when it comes to thinking about the health of a person and what, what we're talking about is a lot of us carry trauma and how that impacts our uh, experience with our reproductive health and through that menopause. Um, and so how does that impact um, how we're going to go through this and then there's then the ceremonies combined with the medicines are so important to to discuss even if it's just in a general way without giving away things or prescribing because sometimes that's not possible as we know if our spirits are hurt um the prescription that the 
uh, medicine person or conductor will give might be different for you than it is for me uh, because it's it's what I need not and it's it doesn't fit everybody but I'm sure that there are like when we talk about um, um, so raspberry leaf or something like that like a common medicine that that you're talking about you know the kind of like you put this leaf on for a poultice or you I think that there's ways that we can talk about this without crossing a line into um i don't know discussing things that shouldn't be discussed on on this kind of format um but i totally agree i'm really interested in that as well and and i would love to know like if there's some good medicines for like insomnia because that's been you know some of the bane of my existence for the past two years and um, particularly in the last year, like, yeah, three, four hours sleep, maybe, you know, and uh, I did hear, though, that that things will return to, to the, the things will level out once the once the hormones start to level out. And that's another thing that I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Janet Smiley when we have her on. Yeah, I was just going to say in terms of the trauma as well, I, I don't know if you have um, midwives coming on, but I know midwives often uh, work with, because the trauma can come out at birth too, when you're, when you're giving birth, uh, during birth. And so um, I don't know a lot about it, but I do know from working with midwives off and on over the years that they, that's one of the things that they need to be prepared for and also that they address, like Indigenous midwives. And of course, midwives have always like in the past, they were the ones that dealt with all of these transitions, right? So they were the ones that obviously catch the babies, but they're like when you're saying, Christy, the ones that send people into the spirit world, they're like the funeral directors, <laughs> like the funeral parlor. Uh, and they had medicines for all those transitions, right? Medicines for birth, medicines for death. Those are midwives. So I don't know about um, midwives now, if, you know, even if we don't have um, a lot of discussion around working through working with trauma that comes up in menopause, it might be worthwhile talking to them about how they work with trauma that comes up in birth, because it's, you know, it's, it's those, they're specialists at transition, right? <laughs> the midwives. And, uh, you know, that might, even if we don't have the knowledge, it might actually lead to being able to consider or to think through what types of things might be used to help going forward, right? Oh, I was going to add something really fast. When I went into by, by the time I went into the woman's clinic, it's like a private woman's clinic. I was so desperate and so depressed and so tired and so hurt by the system, just going to other doctors and stuff. I sat in her office with the doctor. And one of the first things she asked me was whether or not I was a trauma survivor. And we had an hour long like appointment and I cried. It was just one of those things where I felt heard after years of reaching out and asking, going to health food stores, going to every, I was just asking and nothing. I mean, I tried everything. Nothing was working for me. But even that session with her and her just sitting there listening, I like, I even feel teary eyed now because it was just so impactful to be heard, especially by a, a physician, by a doctor you know, it was almost like an affirmation. Okay, well, that's why we're here. Uh, we're sorry that this is privatized, but we hope to, <laughs> you know, open her doors and be more accessible. But that's just where it is in terms of women's health, sadly. Um, but that says a lot too, is just being heard and having those conversations about trauma and how trauma impacts any kind of change. Adversity indeed does, you know, impact uh, changes in body. Um, and what comes up for you too. But that's it. I mean, I'm been going there now for almost four years and it's been, you don't even have to say you can, there's alternative ways. They have other people or specialists in there too. You could choose to do whatever you want to do. But also there was this um, thing they do, they do this, um, you collect your urine for 24 hours and they send it away. And then it comes back and it tells you all the vitamins and what you need or your deficits. Like, it's just one of those, it's a comprehensive kind of test. And then I realized I was taking too much of this vitamin and less of, you know what I mean? And it was just something or where my hormones and everything were at. So just all that knowledge moving forward makes a huge difference in terms of learning what your body's going through. So I do recommend visiting a woman's clinic. It can be expensive, but if you have a credit card, like I used 
in school. It was so worth it for me. I just, it really did change my life for the better because I've been struggling for about 15 years now and I'm still struggling. So I'm one of those ones that have had it really, really bad. So I wish I was one of those people like Michelle that just kind of, it ended in a day. <laughs> I was like, how is that possible? Anyways, but uh, you know, we're all so different, but yeah, I just wanted to add that. Like, I just feel like the work that they do is so important. I just wish it was way more accessible and it was covered, but it's not, unfortunately, but maybe that's the next push is that we have to make sure that women's health is covered by the system. Yeah. So can I ask you, Jules, when you say a women's clinic, what does that mean? It's like a woman's health clinic or something? Yeah, it's a women's yeah. health clinic. It's it's more heard. open. That's the umbrella term, obviously, whoever identifies or, or um, whoever identifies as a woman and so forth. And I, I feel like there's an umbrella term there, but anybody who is looking to have any kind of hormonal or, or estrogen or progesterone kind of their bodies change. Sorry, I'm not articulating this well, but it's, it's more of a clinic that is focused on anyone going through any kind of change in their bodies, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Not necessarily gender specific. Yeah, no, I just never, <laughs> That's what I'm trying to say. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I just never heard of it. So I didn't know like what. Yeah, they're all that? private. It's it's private. Like in Vancouver, I think we have two. I don't know about Toronto, but I mean, most um, cities will have like maybe one or two women focused clinics or it depends on how they're what they call themselves. But yeah, they are private but physicians and so forth. Yeah, I think in addition to having access to clinics that do do that kind of specialty work, there's definitely a need for medical doctors in general to be yeah. more alive to a woman and what she might be going through or what they might be going through in terms of menopause. Like I, I had frozen shoulder and I only recently found out that it is common in women with menopause and when I went to my first doctor she had no clue what was the matter sent me to a sport clinic and they told me that was what I had and none of them considered my age and asked me about hot flashes or anything like that to tell me that this is part of unfortunately <laughs> menopause so I think there needs to be real um effort on the part of doctors in general to become more aware of everything about menopause. I was just going to put the link in the chat for the woman's uh, West Coast, and then you can kind of read up on it. But yeah, I'll just throw that in the chat. Thanks. I'm interested. Well, it's been a really great um, session. We thank you so much, uh, Jules and Kim, for joining us today. Uh, it's It's been uh, enlightening and helpful to have this discussion in many ways, reaffirming some of the things that we we already knew or suspected and, and opening us up to ideas that maybe we haven't considered before. So I just wanna thank you both very much for taking the time uh, as Tanya and I have said often, we we're not. This is not um, something that's organized by, by anybody else. It's it's just me and Tanya pulling together these webinars for for funsies <laughs> with uh, the help of our our uh, uh, support person uh, Nicole Van Stone with our our gratefulness to her for for today. And tomorrow we are being joined by uh, Doreen Day who is a midwife. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with her, Kim, but Doreen is, uh, she's Anishinaabe, um, and she's going to be, she's she's a, a keeper of songs, a ceremonial uh, person, um, and she is uh, a person who is practicing uh, birthing in lodges, so she's bringing that back, so when babies are born, they're being born to song in the lodge, in ceremony, um, and I, I just think that that's so incredibly powerful, and I, I would like to see it everywhere. And so as a midwife, we'll, we'll be asking her those questions. I do remember one time she mentioned that, actually, we went to go see her, and um, she mentioned uh, the trauma, um, how somebody who is, is uh, going through birthing has to, has to if, they're, if they've experienced trauma, sometimes the midwives have to know how to handle that. So it's a great reminder to to ask her that question tomorrow. And uh, and we will also be joined by uh, Edna Manitowabi, who is a, an Anishinaabe elder um, 
She is in Wikwemakong First Nation, and she will be joining us uh, to discuss Anishinaabe perspective, I suppose, on uh, on menopause. And like we said, we were trying to uh, bring in people to give different perspectives from different nations. Um, I think that it's it's important not to pan indigenize anything. Uh, to be specific as we can, there's going to be commonalities, but there will also be things that are specific to our nations, and and that's really important to share that information as well. So, closing words to um, to Tanya. Thank you. Yeah, I just really wanted to thank you both for agreeing to come on the show, a show. I keep calling it a show. I don't even know what else to call it, but the conversation. Thank you for joining our conversation. Um, I, I just also wanted to let everybody know that uh, we have a Facebook group and our Twitter, and that's generally how we communicate what we're doing and everything like that. So if you want to look for the books for Kim Anderson or the film for Jules Kostashin, we'll post the links on our Twitter feed and on our Facebook group so you can find it there. And Jules, do you think you would be okay if we posted uh, the information for the clinic? On yeah, yeah. Uh, West Coast Clinic is the one that's in Vancouver. I um, also have a film called Placenta. You can share that too. That's on YouTube. So, okay. okay. All right. I've got lots of stuff on my Vimeo you could check out. Um, I call them ceremonial films. When my kids cut their hair for the first time, all that kind of fun stuff. <laughs> okay, that's great. We'll definitely post all the links up um, on our socials. And I don't and answer any big questions, though. I just pose them. <laughs> <laughs> You just think about them. I yeah, just think about them and ask people questions and then well, we still don't have an answer, but that's okay. That's, that's life. Definitely part of the process, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, so that that's really it for me. Um, any last quick words from Kim or Jules? No, just thank you. I can see in the comments people are thanking you too for doing this and having the conversations and you got a great lineup of all these different perspectives. So yeah. Just to the two of you. And nice to see you, Jules. And nice, nice to see everybody out there. I see some names of people I recognize. Yeah. Cool. It's called um what well, it's when Kim asked me that question, sorry, I butchered the answer. It's around integrative health. So you can look at holistically how you want to, you know, work with your symptoms and so forth. Integrative health is what I meant to say in one sentence as opposed to butchering your the response in 20 sentences. <laughs> But thank you, Chimiguach. I'm, I'm hoping that people walk away with more questions and answer them and then find ways to answer them and share information. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, everybody. I'm going to hit the stop record now. And, um, and then if everyone can just uh, exit <laughs> stage left. Thanks. <laughs>